this transmission. And, uh, and I sure hope that at the end you have an idea of what it is, it is of what we are looking for when we speak about accreditation. Today I'm representing Middle States Commission in Higher Education. I am a, a vice president at the Commission of Higher Education. And the university that we're sitting at, right now you're sitting at standing, the New Jersey City University is a member of our organization. The work that we do is all about accreditation. And what this means, it's something that has been a convention between regional accreditors in the United States. It's, a, it's an agreement. And what we hope to do is to inform the public. All of us are interested in informing the public about the strength of our higher education system in the United States and elsewhere that we do accreditations. So this is what we're looking after. This is what we're looking forward into the next spring of 2020 to be able to do the same for New Jersey City University. And that's the reason why I've been here, we have been here, and working with your design for the self-study report since, uh, since the beginning of April. It, I think it was, the, the, in April the 1st was the date that I received your, your design. So um, we accredit, and as the, as the slide mentions, we demonstrate uh, that this institution, just as any other institution, is, is in, engaged, is really committed to continuous self-assessment. So that means that everything that we do has to show that has been assessed and that assessment is kind of a mantra with us. So we need to assess everything. Okay, Every standard, even though it doesn't include the word assessment in its in its context, in the definition, maybe, it has the word and the actions of assessment embedded in it. So there's no standard that can go or can be evaluated without assessment. And for in terms of accreditation, we would say that accreditation is intended to support the three goals that are related to the central uh, goal which is, or the central mission, that is strengthen and sustain higher education, make it worthy of the public confidence, and of course, trying to minimize the external control. That's something that we would really like to, to achieve. I don't know, okay. Who is Middle States Commission in Higher Education? Well, of course, we're not an office. We are you. If, if the institutions weren't here, Middle States Commission for Higher Education wouldn't exist. So it's really a combination of the people who work in the office to make things happen, hopefully, to help the institutions move forward, and the institutions who are the real actors, the important actors in this, in this uh, movement. Middle States is comprised, as I'm gonna tell, is part of a group of regional accreditors Okay, it's a combination of different regional accreditors of which the dark blue is, is, covers the western states and, and uh, the center, I don't know why California is, is different, but it, there, there must be an explanation for that. And the central part has a different one, it's Higher Le Learning Commission. The lower part of the map, the blue, the light blue, the real turquoise blue, is SACS, that's the Southern Association of Colleges and, and States. And uh, Middle States is the blue on the eastern coast up there that includes New York, Pennsylvania, and basically it's, that's all you can read because the rest of the states are very small, but they are right there. It's Delaware, New Jersey, um, Maryland, and if you see down in the map, for some, in, for some interesting region of reason, not related to geography, not at all, Puerto Rico is included in the Middle States and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We have also the British Virgin Islands, but we did not include them here because we didn't want to go 
into areas that are not related into the United States, not in this slide. But the British Virgin Islands are also accredited, and so are certain universities in several other parts of the world. So it's, it's, it covers the whole, the accreditation process is just as good for any institution in the United States. It's only that our region is called the Mid-Atlantic, so we call it Middle States. And in the mainland, the, these are the states, as I told you, that are included in the region and overseas. You can see a display of the other countries into which we have gone. And currently, certain institutions, not all, have um, accreditation by middle states. At this point, our portfolio e exceeds 530 accredited or candidate institutions because we are bringing four new institutions. They're not yet there, but we're bringing four more to the June's Commission meeting. So it's going to be for 530, hopefully, accredited institutions in by, by the, or in the process of getting accredited, 530, 57% of which are private, non-for-profit, and you see the, the distribution right there. It doesn't add to 100, because there's some special kinds of things that are special kinds of classifications that we didn't want to include because there's a long list. Why is this process important for an institution, or why should an institution go be through this process, which is so intense, intense in labor and dedication beyond informing what we have already told the, about high quality, about trust. Well, in terms of trust, schools go through, universities go through self-evaluation. We devise our own program of evaluation. We decide how we want to be evaluated. We design the model that we are going to be using. That's the point where we're at now. And then we elaborate the, the report. We have a certain amount of months to work on the report. The report goes to the, to the Commission for Higher Education, and from there on, we pass it on to a team who's going to visit you two years from today, maybe, a year and, and 10 months from today. Spring 2020, that's your target. Some where in those months of, uh, between February and before April the 15th, you will have a visit. And that team is our peers, our people, faculty, and administrators from different universities in the same region, hopefully, maybe from different regions, but who are considered to be able to evaluate in a just way your self-study report. So that means that they, we need to pick them from institutions that are, have characteristics that are similar to NJC. Otherwise, they won't be able to understand. And that's the reason why it's so important to be clear about who we are. And in the end of the design, we have already a list of characteristics and and qualities that we need to look into, and I, I've been asking them to review them. So if you have any recommendations, just let um, Dr. Sue Gerbert know about them. Okay, then the peers come here. They receive your report six weeks before the deadline of, for the evaluation visit. They, will, they won't receive the report before that. It's just six weeks ahead. So if we, if we say that the visit is going to happen, mid-March, they will only receive the report by the end of January. That's the only time that they have to get acquainted with the report and they won't be able to call you or anything, okay? They will just tow the institution by the report. So that's why the report needs to take that into consideration. Please write to yourselves because you're the first audience of the, of the self-study report. But please take into consideration your readers, your evaluators. They need to know you and understand you. You have to be clear with the ones that don't know you. You have to convey the real sense of what you mean to say in a clear way. Because they, they want to have the easiest experience here and the, the more just, the, you know, the better, the better qualified opinion of you. You can only do that if you follow standard eight. And standard eight is write 
clearly for your reviewers. That's my standard, <laughs> not middle state standard. But it's true, it's true. And uh, I, it's, a, it's good advice, it's just advice. Okay, so that happens, and they come here for a day and a half, maximum two days. They go around, questions, meetings, just very fine the information. They will probably want to look at some data. You will be able to provide the data because you have incredible amounts of data. And you have the experience of having been discussing that for almost two years. And in the end, they produce their own report. That's the, those are the blue books over there. They send the, that report to us, the commission, in which they will, before leaving, before leaving, they will make an oral report here to you. It's an open session in which the team chair will let you know, standard by standard, what is the opinion of the, of the team members. And the opinion is whether you comply or not comply with the standard. That's it. They will read the standard. They will mention all the commendations that they have for you, which is, oh, you're so good. This is was written clearly. This is so precise. All those commendations. If they have any uh, collegial suggestions, they will write them there and let you know and let you know in the oral report. And if they have any recommendations, they will let you know there too. But that's the extent of the communication. Standard by standard, it will be repeated seven times. And that's it. At the end of the seventh one, everyone will pack everything and leave the room because the commission is the only one. The Commission of Higher Education is the only one that can make a decision on whether the institution gets accredited or not. So the team, the team will not be able to do that. What they will tell you is whether they find you in compliance at this point with each standard and any recommendations or suggestions you, they have for you, for the institution. This, this report will then go to the commission. It's, those are the hands that you see there. Your president is a member of the Commission of Higher Education, probably by June. And that's when the report will be analyzed by the commissioners and a decision on accreditation for the institution will be reached. That decision we will have to address to the U.S. Department of Education first. And now by federal regulation, it will take a week after we send it to the U.S. Department of Education until we can tell you what the result is. So now we are, because of this regulation, we cannot tell immediately the institutions that we, until a week goes by. I need to tell you that because whereas before, immediately after the commission, you could call and they could tell you, not now. That's, that's not the rule now. Oh, this one's, okay. The accreditation process then is, uh, has been changed to make it more, much more continuous, agile, and not let the, not to allow the institutions to forget about their, their self-study and their assessment uh, data. So uh, we are starting a new process called the Annual Institutional Update. And the, its real name is AIU. Everything we refer to by, <laughs> by those letters, AIU, the Annual Institutional Update. It's a, it's an electronic device, it's an electronic platform created to gather data from different sources that describe every one of the institutions that's in our portfolio. And then it will have an opportunity, a space, in which every institution will tell about their finance, health, and their students in terms of quality and, and results of education, assessment of education outcomes. And those are the only questions that every institution will have to address in this annual institutional update. The, you will have the opportunity to address also any recommendations that the commission adopted from the ones that, this, that the self-study uh, team included in their own report. The self-study team could include 15 recommendations and the commission could adopt the 15 or could adopt three, four of them. You will only be requested to answer to those that are adopted by the commission, okay? It's a, it's, it's a platform, it's a, it has a limit in words, it has a limit into everything that can be inputted into it. It will have to be accompanied by appendixes of support, data support if need be. 
The second, that, that goes on for three years, starting this coming August. Goes on for three years, because now the accreditation cycle is eight years in length. So the annual institutional updates is filled out three times after a visit. And then the fourth year, it's a, it's a, summer, it's, it's a summary of those previous annual institutional updates, what we you will be having to report. And it's called the Midpoint Peer Review, or MPPR for short. <laughs> MPPR, it's just the same thing as, or intends to take the place of the previous PRR. Those of you who had been here a certain number of years know what the PRR is. It's the Periodic Review Report. It used to be filled out every five years, which is midpoint in the accreditation cycle, the way it was before. But since the accreditation cycle has been shortened to eight years now, the midpoint peer review occurs on the fourth year after a self-study evaluation report. That's why you will fill three annuals and the midpoint peer review. And then from there on, three more, and then you will have your self-study report on the eighth year after this. So that's, that's the engagement, that's the process for the, for that we are just starting in this time of the year for uh, NJCU. What we work with is what we call the requirements of affiliation and standards of accreditation, which are, um, you, you all have them, you all have access to them. It's the yellow, the yellow and white booklet with red letters on them. That one spells out each one of the standards of accreditation the way it, they, want to, they need to be read and worked upon. And then underneath every standard, there's a certain number of criteria. We need to go through all of those. We need to decompose. We need to separate. We need to dissect the standard as is expressed and then address each part of it and related, all of them have to be related to number one, mission and goals. Because that's what the institution is here for, to accomplish a mission. And your mission is mostly the students. It's basically the students. Without students, we are other thing, but not a university, any other thing. Might be a pharmacy, we might be a, a research institute, we may be whatever, but not a university. So everything needs to be referred to the mission and goals. So even though there's one standard that's specific for mission and goals, and there's a working group here that's going to be working on it, everyone else needs to refer, refer their, their work to number one, to mission and goals, because everything needs to be centered into that. If you think of a planetary model, mission and goals would be the sun. And apart from it, there's several other standards that go around it. Right? Ethics and integrity is the second one, which sometimes is challenging when you look at it, say, guessing what in, is it that we're supposed to inform here. Well, of course, it's, a, it's an aspiration that every university, every college works with the highest standards of ethics, and that everything that we, that we do in the university is coherent and works towards um, showing, demonstrating the high level of ethics that we, under which we work in the university. And that includes students, conducts, faculty, and staff, administration, and up to the board of uh, regents or up to the board of trustees, depending on the name of that high governing board for every institution. It has to do with the review of policies, procedures, processes, and the realization that the, the data, the gathering, the assessment, that it, they are co being, that there's compliance with those everywhere. We don't pass judgment, once again, we don't pass judgment on the content. Every institution defines their own. But what we need to do is, once they are defined, this is what guides the university, and it's being done, and it's being done with rigor. There's rigor in the compliance, and there's coherence in the compliance, so everybody could feel safe on working in this area, okay? Number three is much more down to earth. 
It's the sign and delivery of the student learning experience, which is something that we would call the teaching. The teaching, everything that goes on, the curriculum, the curriculum really, and, and the academic policies and everything that goes on in the different schools and programs. Number four is the support, and that includes faculty, of course. Number four is support of student effect experience. That is specifically geared to all the rest of the services that are not within the classrooms or the, or the laboratories or the clinical settings or the school settings for the students. Every, all those supports that you deliver to students which are, you know, the library, IT, I, um, as, um, I mean, my God, counseling, social work, um, if you have child care, ch child care, if you have, um, I don't know, all these services that you have here in the institution that are medular to fulfilling the mission and to making it possible for the students to obtain their degrees and their, and their programs and their development as human beings the way that, this, that the university envisions it to be, those are to be uh, assessed and included in the support of student experience. Then the assessment of the assessment. Of course, educational effectiveness, we assess everything we do. We assess teaching, but we assess services, we assess everything, including the Board of Regents, including the Board of Trustees, including the governance. Everything needs to be assessed. And that's something that is a trend and has been more and more published by the Association of Governing Boards of, of universities, more and more they're going and writing about the role of trustees and the role of, of, of the uh, different bodies in terms of governance and the, and the accreditation of the different universities. Number six is right, uh, I, I guess more, it's easier for people to grasp the meaning, which because it's planning, and we also we are all used to talking about planning and strategic planning and all of that. Resources, what do we have, not just planning, and the institutional improvement. That means, do, are we using that in the correct way to make to reach our goals, to produce the results that we need to to produce? In order to answer that, institutional improvement. You know what we have to do? Assess. Assess and reach conclusions. So it's a matter of gathering data, asking the right questions, gathering data, and then evaluating what the data means in terms of the institution. And of course, the last one is governance, leadership, and administration, because we want to know. In terms of the prop, the own, their own uh, I mean the institution itself, how is it working with its own procedures, policies, and, uh, and everything that goes on in the university. So it's a dynamic way of looking at the institution and the way in, in which poetically, or storytelling that we want to look at the standards is an accredited institution of higher education has an appropriate mission. You design and devise your own mission. It's appropriate to you. And that's one question for the, stand, the, the working group that's working standard one. Is it appropriate? Well, number two lives it with integrity, number two. Delivers an effective student learning experience, that's standard three, and supports it overall, overall with student experience both inside and outside of the classroom, and that would be standard four. That's year two, mission and the way it's, it works for students and the academic area of the university. Uh, an accredited institution of higher education assesses its own educational effectiveness, needs to do that, and that's the work that we're all immersed now. Uses planning resources and resources to ensure the institutional improvement, so that's another question. Are we really using them to, to improve what's happening in the university? And in, in the end, it's characterized by the effective governance and leadership that everybody here displays. But beyond that, because we like to be nice and good and wide in scope, we have the requirements of affiliation. These are requirements that we need to address within the self-study because they relate, some of them relate to the, to, the, to the standards, some don't. The ones in blue 
are the requirements of affiliation and uh, the other ones, and the ones in yellow are related to missions, uh, I mean to standards directly. And these are the 15 that are requirements of affiliation and those we need to address because we need to be um, responsible for this. For example, we need to know that this institution is authorized to operate. That's not Middle States uh, territory. That's the state of New Jersey who licenses you to operate. Well, we need to know that you're licensed and that your license is current because we have found institutions that are not licensed to operate by anybody. So, but we don't deal with that. So this is a matter of showing the evidence. This is evidence, okay? Number two, the institution is operational. Of course, you need to be operational. What university is, not, is, is, is a university if it doesn't have students? Only when it's summer and maybe, and maybe not even then. Or if, or if you have a strike. Well, there for, there, for example, we have had institutions in several places that have been placed on probation because this, they, there was a strike and it extended for probably two or three months. So the institution was not operational. And if the institution is not operational, it's closed, it's not doing its work, then we need to inform the U.S. Department of Education because they are receiving or they, if they are eligible for Title IV grants that needs to be stopped because otherwise we are going to be responsible for that. I mean, Middle States is responsible for that if we don't inform. So the institutions need to be operational. You, you might say that that's ridiculous, but it happens, it happens. Have at least one class that has graduated. So this is just data, this is just inform. Yes, we do have this, and the, and the, and the, and the corroboration, you know, you have, you have it there, the verification. Number four, communicates with Middle States in English. Well, we have to do this only because in Middle States there's many people who don't speak Spanish or who don't speak Arabic or who don't speak any other language. So the official, commu of official communication is always in English. We have many institutions in parts of the world who speak other languages and we understand that their own documents for their own purposes might be written in that other language. So we take, have to take that into consideration because then when we send teams, we need to include people who speak that other language. Not all of them, but at least one or two in order that we need to check or verify documents because that's, there's a relationship with the state that needs to be in the language. That's the official language of the place that we are at. Okay. Compliance with government policies, regulations, and requirements. If you're required by the state to have a staircase every 30 feet, well, you must show, because if it's a requirement of the state, that you have those staircases every 30 feet. That's not middle states, but you have to comply because those are requirements. And in the, you can read the rest of them because they are not that different, but I mean there are requirements of affiliation that don't have to do with quality I mean, it's, it's just compliance. We have to do that, okay? And they're imposed by other institutions. And these are answered mostly easily because it's, yes, we have it, and here's the evidence. But it needs to be part of the self-study report. So when you read the, that same document, that same uh, pamphlet over there, you will find the, the requirements of affiliation. I think it's there at the end. I, I think first are the standards. And after the standards, they don't have them? No? They should. All right. And then we have the verification of compliance. That's a different one. And <laughs> that's another part that we need to address within the self-study report or side by side with the self-study report. And this is something that we need to inform. The way the regulation is now, we have to inform Middle States, about three months ahead of the self-study report visit, that we comply with all of this. It's a different document. I don't know if you have it here. Do you have the verification of compliance here? Um, thank you. Because that, that one is also a document that's part of the, the self-study um, accreditation process. And it needs to be filled by somebody responsible in the institution, and it's also something that needs, uh, has legal implications to it. And these are the requirements. 
that we, you need to address. If you, have a, if you have distance education programs, there needs to be evidence that you can verify, for example, your student's identity and in the process of distance education. So that this is policies. Okay, you, you have it, Wait, okay, it's written here, and then, then there is a hot link or something that links it to the, where you have it in the institution. Transfer of credit policies, this is so important, and articulation agreements. You cannot assert that you have a joint program if you don't have an articulation agreement signed and active and current. So we need, that needs to be spelled out, because that's part of the university's operation. So, and this is not related to accreditation in terms of the quality, but it is, it's part of the responsibility of the institution as a, as a social and educational entity. So they, it, needs to be it needs to be verified. That you have Title IV responsibilities and that you fulfill them. That you keep the institutional record of student complaints. So the grievance processes are very important and we need them. We need them clear, clearly spelled out. And if there's any problems, we should know about. There's a right to know act, and we need to know that everything is there and that everything is up for examination if need be, but that you have it. It's not going to be included in the report, but you need to have that evidence. And, and from there on, the rest of them, which I think are mostly easy to understand, required information for students and public, because public needs to be informed of several Clery Act and several others. Um, we need to comply with FERPA, we need to comply with, those are regulations on, on the access to information, to students' information, you, you need compliance of all of those, and it needs to be written and spelled out. Contractual relationships. This is not contractual relationships for the cafeteria services or for cleaning, no, that's not it. It's contractual relationships if you have contracted with uh, university, ne the next doors, it's called next door university, and if you have contracted with them to teach 20% of your courses, there needs to be a contract that needs to be prepared and informed to middle states because that, those are contractual relationships that do affect the delivery of the educational experience. But we do not mean other types of uh, contracts for repair, roof repair, no, that's not it. Because we have had questions about it, no, no, okay. And the assignment of credit hours because we need to know that every course that's Three credits is valid for the amount of hours that we have informed the Department of Education la, 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 for, for that, because there's, really, there's something there that needs to be informed to the Department of Education, and we want the university to be clear on all aspects. And if, there's, if there are conversions or if there are any transitions, they need to be explained. It's not, we cannot tell a university how to do its job, but we will ask you to have the evidence of how you reached that decision and to have the reasons for it. Okay. The self-study process. We have a steering committee, we have working groups, and then we have the whole community, of course. And uh, we want to make it clear that we, what you need to do is to focus on your own work. Focus on what you do every day and then try to Please present it in the more, the more concise and coherent way in the documents so that we can address the standards and the requirements of affiliation. Never forgetting that everything that we do needs to be mission related, mission and goals related, and priorities, of course. So we need to oversee the compliance report. You need to oversee that that report is already filled out, and this process for, all, for us takes between 2.5 or maybe two years up to the next, up to your next visit. Year one, that's already started since last fall. Uh, well, we have, you went, some people from here went to the Self-Study Institute, and uh, these are actions that are regularly part of the process of accreditation for every institution. In, in fall, we have the Self-Study um, Institute. The steering committee is probably was probably appointed or chosen or designed. And of course, this, the liaison, 
you pick a schedule for the self-study preparation visit. This didn't happen this time because this, the liaison for this institution retired from Middle States. And I just started with them back in February, so we had to appoint this visit really about a month ago, but it's something that couldn't be avoided. During the spring, which is where we are now, you determine the, the groups that will be needed, but you have already all of them. You include the designations and, and the staff liaison conducts, this me, conducts a self-study preparation visit. That's what I'm doing today. And you afterwards, I will receive at some point during the next two months, hopefully, I will receive the self-study design from the institution with all the the gadgets that we have spoken about today, hopefully, or some of them, the ones that you decide that you're going to address, and then you will send that model that designed to be, I'll read again, and probably approve it, and from there on, you can start working right away because it's not gonna change, basically, but um, that's the way that it should happen. Next fall, the steering committee works hard, 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 working on everything and the working groups gathering information and all of that. They submit reports until, and the team begins to, ac to assemble the compliance uh, documentation. And next spring, next spring, I will be addressing Dr. Dr. Henderson, Dr. Sue Henderson, with a letter telling her, Doctor, I have two candidates to be the team chair for your institution. Uh, and these are their names, and these are the, this is where you can find them. These are their qualities, their attributes. See if you can accept any of them. And then Dr. Henderson has the opportunity to accept or reject my proposition. I hope she accepts one of them because it has happened to me that they reject both. And so I have to start working again, trying to find another pair of team chairs. The reason I inform too is because if they, I tell them in the letter, if you can't accept candidate number one, and if you have any conflict or see any conflict with, with that person, please look at candidate number two, otherwise I will appoint his or her immediately unless you tell me not to. So it's a long process because the, the letters go out, they take time until they return, until they decide if they want a person. No, I don't want a provost as my team chair. I want a president, an act, but this one person was president and retired. No, I want an active president. So this, and then you, I am competing in choosing team chairs with 70 other institutions because everyone needs a team chair. And we're, every time we go on accreditation, we have about 70 at the same time. So uh, my pool of candidates reduces each time as long as this goes. So I try to have the best team for you as soon as possible. We set the dates once we have the team chair. We will only have the team chair when it's, once it's agreed with the institution. And then I, I'll inform the person who was chosen. And that person has the capability of saying, no, I don't want to be the team chair for that institution. And there I start again. So it's a, an iterative process. It, it may take long. So, and then if, if we reach an agreement, then I send a letter to everyone telling, okay, you're visiting this institution, president, this person is gonna be the team chair. Please talk together and set a date for the preliminary visit of the chair. That's gonna happen four months before the, before the visit. And hopefully set a date for next year, for spring 2020, in which you will be able to receive the team visiting your campus. And that, and by that time, we will be receiving drafts from, while we're doing that, you will be very busy receiving drafts and everything from the working groups and all of that. Third year, fall, the campus community and the board, everybody here will be reviewing the draft. We'll be working on final decisions on the draft. You will send the report, the draft report, to the team chair, and that person will come here during the months of October or November 2019 and visit, visit with you for a day or day and a half. And we'll have the draft of your self-study report. So that person is gonna meet again with the steering committee, with the working groups, with faculty, with students, with everybody, going through the draft of the report now. 
and working with you back and forth so that they sh that you can make the fine tunings and the rec follow recommendations, not from me then, but from the team chair, okay? And the compliance report, the way that it is now, should be sent approximately at that same time to the commission because it's uh, sent about four months ahead. And in spring, we will have the, meet, the visit here and uh, the team report and the institutional response because you have the opportunity to respond to that team report once it's uploaded into the commission's website. And in spring, then the commission meets and decides. What can happen? Well, we can find that everything is great and wonderful and lovely, and we will only have to address significant accomplishments, which is my best hope, significant progress, which is wonderful too, exemplary or innovative practices, you know, everything good, everything fine. We will hopefully discuss suggestions, which are collegial words to you, my advice, recommendations which carry a heavier weight, and requirements, I guess, are going away, hopefully, are going away. At this point, they still exist, and requirements mean you have to do this. It's not your choice. You have to do it. The best possible outcome, and I'm wishing that for you, is the dark green reaffirmation of accreditation. That's what I would love to see every time, any time. In the case that that doesn't happen because there is concern that you may not comply with any standard or are not in the sense of the team complying with one standard or, or one requirement of affiliation, then there will be some follow-up. And the worst scenario that I would hate to see happen in any institution, non-compliance, that really I don't want to see happen because that puts accreditation in jeopardy. And that entails consequences, terrible, but bad ones. None, n n there's no good one here of warning or probation for the institution, monitoring reports or small with, a, with a small team visit. And it only gives the institution two years not by us, but, for the, but by the Department of Education, because if in two years it's not solved, then they can pull out uh, the, the access to funding under Title IV. It's their date, not ours. So we want everything to go through, fine. This, the best scenario, and the only one that we are hoping that will happen is the one that's gonna happen. And because we're all middle states, we're working here, we're working in every aspect that we can play, evaluators, um, focus groups. We want to invite everyone in campus. There needs to be open communication here and the, and the other locations. Open communication, flow of communication, everything that can make this process give the institution ownership and empowerment over it, that's what we need to do. And of course, I have answered many of your questions. I still can answer questions. My big question to you is, we are searching for volunteers to help us move ahead the process of accreditation in many other institutions. Will you help us? Right now it's not the moment because the website's going away, but there's gonna be a new website. And uh, in, in there you can fill out that information very soon starting in August, if you want to be part of the accreditation body of middle states. I still have the, the open question for you, if you wanna be, make, make some questions. All right, and this is my last slide. This is only for contact information for you, because I'm leaving very soon. I'm not a self-study report uh, team, but I really wanna say thank you, and appreciate the time, the attention, and the questions. Um, questions do not need to be over. That's my information. Dr. Sue, Sue Gerber is here. She's, um, she's been wonderful. So thank you all very much. And well, I can take questions, but just for five minutes because I need to leave. I don't want to cut without having this opportunity. Your traffic train. Yes, yeah, I've been <laughs> but I'm leaving. This is this stays here. This stays here, so you can use it, discuss it. If, you don't, if something wasn't clear, you can ask her to call me back, uh, I'll answer. I'm available on Skype. 
I'm available anytime. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Hope the best to all of you.